All right, folks, Yishai Fleischer here, and I'm sitting on the airplane, just about to take off from Ben Gurion Airport to Miami, and then from there to Jacksonville for just a second, and then from there to Tallahassee, where I'm going to be speaking this Shabbat to Chabad and the Jewish Student Union and Hillel. I'm very excited. Got to prepare that speech on this flight as well. This is going to be really fun. It's been a very hectic week, but I still got a show for you, a special one in, in, in that uh, because we have uh, three interviews that I did this week, one with the uh, Knesset member who's in charge of the Constitution, Justice, and Law Committee. Uh, that's Simcha Rothman, and one with Uri Bank, who's the who's the faction whip uh, of the Religious Zionist Party, and uh, one with Zev Warnstein from the City of David. And I think these three interviews really are uh, indicative, uh, are descriptive of the time that we're living in, and we're here on the show. Even when we don't have time, we try to push out a little bit of a sense of what's happening in the Israeli life, and Israeli culture, and, the, of course, the great process moving forward in um, strengthening the state of Israel, which is uh, the vehicle that brings us to the land of Israel. What a gift. What an opportunity. Well, you are listening to the Yishai Fleischer Show. We are broadcasting live from Ben Gurion Airport. It is an honor and a pleasure. And uh, let's start with our triad uh, of interviews with Uri Bank talking about the situation uh, at the Knesset and what this government helps to achieve. After that, we'll go to uh, Simcha Rothman. And, uh, no, after that, we'll go to Zev Warnstein from the City of David. And then finally, we'll finish it up with Simcha Rothman, Cadet member Simcha Rothman. So that's really fun uh, that I got a chance to do these interviews this week and get out of show this week. It's been very hectic, but I love you. And because of that, uh, I love doing the show to, to, give you, to give you any kind of connection that I can uh, to this good land and this good story. So st- stay tuned. And, of course, thank you to Ben Bresky for mastering everything and also the rest of our crew, Yochevet Seidman, uh, Moshe Herman, Tabitha, and Lewin were live for making it happen. Here we go. Let's get to our interviews uh, from the good land, from the land of Israel, straight to you. All right, folks. Yishai Fleischer here. I am... Uh, the Has Promenade at a very special place overlooking the Temple Mount. I see the Temple Mount. Um, right now, Golden Dome is lit up. I see the old city. And from this vantage point specifically, you could see uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, the three uh, towers that adorn it. And you also see uh, the, the valley between myself here, which is the, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, what do we call it? Tyropian. Yeah, the Ty- Tyropian Valley, that's right. <laughs> But you really see from here also the city of David, uh, which which really is is not understood by everybody. But just, just kind of a, a little tiny intro. What we know is the old city of Jerusalem was actually not ancient Jerusalem. Ancient Jerusalem was to the south of the Temple Mount. It had a wall kind of around it, uh, and it was called the city of David. That's the beginnings of the city. Today, it's the uh, it, the city of David is also part of the Arab neighborhood called Silwan, and it's outside the walls. But of course, the organization City of David has done an amazing, amazing job uh, at excavating the city of David, finding its ancient defenses, its ancient waters. Um, and it's going on and on. It's become uh, one of the most important tourist attractions in Israel. And for myself, as somebody who works in Hebron, we look not only to the City of David as an archaeological site, but also an or- as an organization that is one of the strongest you know, leadership organizations to how to bring a heritage, the biblical heritage, back out uh, into the public sphere. It's led by one David Be'eri, who is really the first religious person in the Sayeret Matkal, the, the famous uh, general staff unit that is the special forces, the special forces unit in Israel. And he's a little guy with hugeness. Okay, he's, he's, he's quite shorter than me, uh, but his exploits are a legend. Uh, and he's doing a great job. Now, the other day I got to see him uh, at an event and I said to him, you know, you got this guy, Zev Ornstein, your director of, uh, of international relations. He's an amazing guy. He goes, he's an amazing guy. Happens to be that me and Zev are friends for a very long time. He's one of my oldest friends. Uh, I know him for um, <clears throat> over 20 years now. And what has always brought us and continues to bring us together is not just our, our friendship and the, that our wives are friends or whatever, uh, and that we enjoy Thanksgiving Shabbos together. Much more than that is also our uh, passion for the rebuilding of Israel, the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, its biblical uh, 
uh, it's biblical image, it's biblical consciousness, and, and really strengthening the Jewish state. Uh, right now, the city of David has a new uh, and a very exciting exploit, which I have only heard uh, parts of. I read it in the news, but I wanted to hear more. And, I, and bef- instead of him telling me, I asked Zev to join me here overlooking the, the Temple Mount and the city of David. Zev, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, Z, so tell me a little bit about, um, tell me about the Siloam Pool. I don't like to say Siloam, so from here on, I'm just going to say the Shiloach, which is called in, in English Siloam, but from here on, we call it the Shiloach Pool, which I have dunked in in, in, in parts of uh, that are partly open, but I heard now that the city of David is now receiving the rights to excavate the whole thing, which is a giant pool, which is the lead up into the Temple Mount. Take it away. So first, what, what is the city of David? The city of David is the place where the kings of the Bible ruled, where the, where the prophets of the Bible preached. Uh, this is the spot where if you think about King David, King Solomon, they weren't hanging out in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, They were walking around the city of David, the place where Jerusalem began. Uh, That is biblical Jerusalem. The old city is uptown Jerusalem, right? The the western wall is about a thousand years after King David. So now, when we talk about the Shiloh pool, right? So 2004, uh, the southern end of the city of David, there was a busted sewage pipe. So now the municipality has to send in construction crews to repair that sewage pipe. But in Jerusalem, Jerusalem's not just another municipality, and the city of David, the place where Jerusalem began, is not just another part of Jerusalem. And here you don't only send in construction crews, you also send in archaeologists. And so the archaeologists, they come in, and they begin to uh, repair the sewage pipe, and inadvertently they end up uncovering a series of ancient stone steps, 2,000 years old, And the archaeologists immediately say there's only one other set of steps in all of Jerusalem that look like those. And those are the steps leading up to the uh, southern ascent of the Temple Mount, the southern steps uh, right before the Holda Gates that would have gone up to the Temple 2,000 years ago. What's, What's special physically about these steps? Uh, just the very wide. Yeah, it's the Herodian uh, architecture, wide steps, different kinds of uh, depths of the steps. Right uh, to slow people down. It's not like an even step. Correct. That you're right. going up with intention. That right. you can't just blindly intentionality. Uh, Two thousand years ago. That's right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, so they said, all right. Well, what are these lower steps, a half a mile apart? And they realized they found the steps leading down to the Shiloh pool. Now, what is the Shiloh pool? The Bible tells us that three times a year, on Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, you would have had everyone having to go up to the temple. Now, before you can go up to the temple, what do you have to do? You have to cleanse, bathe, go to a ritual bath, a mikvah, right? The historian Josephus says that 2,000 years ago, say on Passover, on Pesach, you would have had nearly 3 million people going on pilgrimage. It's a lot of people. The Shiloh pool was the size of two Olympic-sized swimming pools, an acre and a half in size. Now, 2004, we discover these steps, and... Up until about three weeks ago, all we had of the pool was about these steps, about 5% of the total. And a so, sliver of water. No, the, we'll see, where you went, where you uh, immersed, that is actually a Byzantine period pool. Uh-huh. Uh, what uh, the Christians believed was, was uh, a place of significance to them. Turned out that was mistaken, that the actual Shiloh pool was not where people go to uh, immerse today in this little strip of water with a couple of columns in it, but the actual... Uh, the steps that lead down into the Shiloh pool, we, we, uh, we only had about 5% of it. And after about a 20-year legal battle, it's an amazing thing, the Greek Orthodox Church, who controls a lot of land in Jerusalem, they, a number of years ago, they sold uh, a bunch of properties. Uh, among those properties that were sold uh, was the Shiloh pool. Now, why they sold it? Uh, Who knows? They say the guy was corrupt, not corrupt. Who knows why the guy sold it? But the guy who was in charge, a patriarch, he sold a whole bunch of properties. Great. After it was sold, and it came out out that that, that this guy sold all these properties, so the Greek Greek Orthodox Church said, well, no, it's an illegitimate sale. And it went from one level of court to the next level of court until ultimately went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And each time the court ruled, look, it was a kosher sale, right? You got a contract, deeds, everything was uh, paid. It's kosher. Uh, And at... A few months ago, the Supreme Court gave the ruling, finished, right? And so, as of a couple of weeks ago, for the first time in 2,000 years, we've begun excavation on the entirety of the Shiloh pool, together with the Israel Antiquities Authority. And in the next couple of years, we will have, for the first time in 2,000 years, the entire Shiloh pool uncovered. Now and it's, it's huge. It's huge. It's the size of two Olympic-sized swimming pools, about an acre and a half in size. But what's special? You look at what's going on, whether it's in Israel today, in the United States today, there's lots of challenges and people are all, uh, you know, stressed out about all sorts of different issues. This saga with the Shiloh pool has been going on for over two decades. And you had people like you mentioned, David Leberi and others, who had the foresight and also the patience to just say, you know what, every day let's just take a step forward. And eventually, 
we'll get to where we need to get to. It's not always uh, the quick results. Sometimes you have to be patient. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm. Uh, that's what Jewish history is in a nutshell. If you give the Jewish people a few years, it probably won't work out well for us. You give us a few thousand years, right. we'll be okay. I will beat you in the long run. Right. And, uh, and so, so now we've begun excavating the Shiloh pool. Now, here's the crazy thing that most people don't realize. When you think of the Shiloh pool today, you think of the pool that goes back to the time of Herod, 2,000 years ago, end of Second Temple period Jerusalem. But we know in the Bible it tells us uh, in the second book of Kings that if you go back 700 years before to the time of Hezekiah, the biblical King Hezekiah, direct descendant of King David, he was the original engineer of the Shiloh pool. Why? The Assyrian Empire was making its way through the region. They got rid of the kingdom of Israel. They got rid of most of the kingdom of Judah. All that was basically left was Jerusalem. And, has, and King Hezekiah says, well... This is Sancarib. Yeah, Sennacherib. 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 Sorry, I didn't get the, the, and, uh, that right the first time. And yeah. in Second Chronicles, it says that why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? So what does Hezekiah do? He takes the Gihon Spring, the, the life-giving waters of Jerusalem, engineers a 533-meter-long tunnel, which we have uh, the Siloam inscription in Hebrew that attests to the, this whole event 2,700 years ago, bringing the waters of the Gihon Spring totally within the walls of the city of David into the Pool of Siloam. 2 Kings 2020 talks all about that Hezekiah builds the conduit, builds the pool. So here's the exciting thing. We're going to uncover the pool right from 2,000 years mm-hmm. ago. But maybe there are still remnants of the original Pool of Siloam going back all the way to the time of First Temple period, 2,700 years ago, to the time of the biblical King Hezekiah. Just a little bit after King David. Yeah, just a couple centuries after King David. And so what we're talking about here is when you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. We are literally uncovering uh, our heritage. And, you know, for our Christian friends also, this is a place that has deep significance. You're talking about a place that has significance for billions of people around the world. It's not an exaggeration. One of the most significant biblical heritage sites in all of Jerusalem. And and we are now going to uncover the whole thing, make it open, make it accessible for everyone to come and connect with the the heritage of the Bible, uh, not simply as a matter of faith, but as a matter of fact, it'll be real. You could see it. You could touch it. Maybe take a little uh, take a little dip in it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Are you going to fill it with water as well or what? First, let's uncover it. We'll yeah, see what's yeah. there. And, uh, you know, but, but the exciting thing also that, that you've seen is right next to the, to the Shiloh Pool is the pilgrimage road. And so archaeologists have already discovered the road that, all right, so now you've immersed in the Shiloh Pool. Now you've got to get, get, get up to the Temple Mount. How did you go on this half-mile journey? Well, you would walk up the pilgrimage road, which is the most significant half-mile anywhere in the world, running from the Shiloh Pool through the city of David up to the footsteps of the Temple Mount. There is no half-mile that means more to more people than the half-mile of the city of David. And in a few years' time, you will literally be able to start your visit to Jerusalem at the Pool of Siloam, at the Shiloh Pool. Walk all the way up from the pool along the pilgrimage road through the city of David, coming out at the footsteps of the Western Wall, the Southern Steps, the Temple Mount. We're bringing Jerusalem back to life. Ancient Jerusalem is coming back to life and is becoming modern again. And as I'm talking to you right now, like I could have had this interview with you anywhere. I wanted to do this interview with you at a restaurant, but there it is right there. Uh, you can see it right behind you there, the, uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, and it's calling, it's beckoning, and its children are around it. Uh, the Jewish people are yearning for it. And I'm asking everybody out there uh, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Check out cityofdavid.org.il cityofdavid.org.il All the social media at, at City of David on YouTube, City of David, Ancient Jerusalem. Uh, and you'll be able to see all the latest developments, discoveries that are that are all happening here. Uh, and just, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, you know, many people, they relate to the Bible. It's okay, it's this book of things that maybe happened a long time ago. And every single day in the city of David, we're unearthing our heritage that shows that our, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Christian, our shared heritage in Jerusalem, Jerusalem's biblical heritage, is not simply a matter of faith, but a matter of fact. And uh, come see it for yourselves. Walk in the footsteps uh, of the Bible. City of David, Zev Ornstein, Director of International Affairs there. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Don't worry. The Isha Inflation Show will be right back. So stay tuned. All right, folks. I'm in the Knesset here with my beloved friend Uri Bank, who's now the Director of the Religious Zionist Faction in the Knesset, one of the only Anglos around right now these days. Uh, Uri Bank... Uh, tell me, you're inside the Knesset here every day. Uh, tell me what's going on. Uh, there's so much 
tension from the diaspora. I just was dealing with the UK Chronicle. They're like, the diaspora's flipping out because of this Knesset. I told them to calm down. Uh, how do you see the tifkud, the, the actualization of uh, the promises to the voter and what's happening in the Knesset right now? Well, before we talk about the reform of the judicial system, which it seems to have everybody up in arms, let's talk about the great things that should have been done long ago that this Knesset has just dived into and we're moving forward legislation to, for instance, take away Israeli citizenship from anybody who was a terrorist and afterwards has been paid by the Palestinian Authority uh, for his terrorist act. It's something very basic, something common sense that hasn't been passed in the Israeli Knesset. And now finally, when we are pushing forward this legislation, we have on both sides of the aisle, uh, uh, I think there's a huge majority, I think 106 out of 120 members of Knesset are supporting this legislation. So just something very basic that should have been done long ago. And now finally we have a government, a cabinet that has common sense and a Knesset that has common sense. So we're passing through things uh, like that. When it comes to the judicial reform, this is something that people who are against the, it's not right wing or left wing specifically, it has more to do about uh, do you believe in judicial activism or don't you believe in judicial activism? This is two schools of thought when it comes to how a judicial system should look like and both ideas are legitimate or both schools of thought are legitimate but in Israel is it really legitimate is it legitimate I thought I thought it was legitimate when you have you know a, a court that has a constitution and looks back into the constitution and is like well this law you know has a problem because it, was, it because it goes against this other law called the constitution but not that it's activist in the sense that it thinks itself as a legislature that could strike down or really make law like our, our, our Supreme Court. I agree. The extreme activism that was adopted by initially uh, Chief Justice Aaron Barak uh, 30 years ago and kind of forced down Israel's throat took it to or, or took the pendulum to an extreme activism type of uh, uh, not only school of thought but he was able to actually put it into the system where we have a Supreme Court that for many years has been serving only one side of Israeli society or on one side of the paradigm that this is the Jewish democratic state. It's only been democratic and, and talking about in universal, um, universal uh, uh, principles and, and ideals when in fact, in Israel, there's this whole other aspect that this is also the Jewish state. And what does the Jewish nature of the state say when it comes to our judicial system and things that are being decided in the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court has tried to, uh, uh, tried to hijack what the Knesset should be doing. The Knesset is the only sovereign representative arm of Israeli government. And the, and the judicial system should be interpreting what the, what the legislative, uh, the Knesset, uh, has written into law. And they've long overstepped their boundaries when it comes to this, and we're bringing it back to the norm. We're bringing it back to something that's more accepted all over the world. Um, you, you say that people abroad are upset uh, uh, or are worried about what's going on. If they go into a comparative of what goes on in their countries and their judicial systems into Israel, they'll be shocked to see how extreme the activism and, and total control of the judicial and the Supreme Court has of issues that should be decided by the Knesset, issues when it comes to the principles and, and the minorities and the, versus the majority, and that's what needs to be changed, and we're going to change that, and we also promised this, meaning it was voted on democratically by the Israeli society that this is what the majority wants. Uh, and therefore, all of... And we understand why the activists, uh, meaning judicial activism, and the left wing in Israel and, uh, is all up in arms because this is a big hunk of cheese that they were able to, I think, uh, illegally able to procure for themselves. And now we're changing it and we're moving that cheese and there's going to be pushback, but it's not the end of democracy in Israel. I would say, I would argue the opposite. This is bringing more democracy and bringing our system back to where it should have been to begin with. All right. Also, your party, uh, the Religious Zionist Party, has the Treasury Minister, Minister of the Treasury, and there's also economic things that are being passed right now. Those economic things are like the things that the average person feels on the day-to-day. -day. And that is something very, uh, you know, it's in our pockets. Our pocketbooks have suffered recently. Things have become more expensive. I need to talk to you about some financial stuff afterwards. And, and like, you know, it's become, it's become harder to, to live in Israel. Um, there, there was a very kind of high-profile uh, live event with Treasury Minister Smotrich and the Prime Minister. They're talking about freezing uh, price costs. 
costs, rising costs of electricity and other things. So tell me a little bit about, about that and about how to, how are we really going to see that the average Israeli is going to be able to buy his apartment, live his life, get up in the morning, feed his kids? Well, here I think it's much less clear cut than our previous conversation about the judicial system because the economics are rough and they're rough worldwide and st raising the standard of living uh, or the, the raising standard of living is never easy for the average citizen in whatever country they're in. So it's a, it's a very delicate balance. What, and, and luckily we have the Prime Minister Netanyahu who is a proven, uh, for, uh, proven finance minister of the state of Israel and he, he will know how to advise Smartridge how to do this in a way where we can keep our economy stable. And I know that they're definitely talking about a lot of uh, bringing in foreign, uh, foreign uh, investment into the state of Israel as a big uh, key to their you know, big goal of theirs for this, for this government. But at the same time, uh, not allowing the, the, the citizens of Israel to, to, uh, to really sink under you know, uh, too much financial burden. It's rough. It's rough, uh, but I think that these are very smart gentlemen who know what they're doing, both Smotrich and Netanyahu, and I'm hoping that uh, the, the average Joe in Israel will feel it in their pockets very soon as well. Amen. All right, so Uri Bank, you're the director of the uh, Religious Zionist Faction in the Knesset. You're meaning to say you're the whip of the, of the faction. You whip them into shape. Uh, you've been in, in Israeli politics for a long time. This is not your first rodeo. Uh, you've been uh, all the way from uh, Rabbi Benny Alona, Lava Shalom, uh, who was a minister, a minister of tourism, of course. Uh, and we thank you very much. We look forward to more of your updates. Thank you, Yishai. Thank the listeners as well. All right, folks, I'm still here uh, overlooking the Temple Mount in Armona and Siv and uh, in the Haas Promenade at a very special place. And I'm here with Knesset member Simcha Rothman uh, and, of course, lawyer and founder of the, uh, what was the organization called? Israel? Movement for Gov Governability and Democracy. That's Meshilut, right. short That's name right. Meshilut. Meshilut. And also the book that you wrote about that, which made a big uh, impact in Israel. And now you're a Knesset member and you're the head of the uh, Constitution and Justice Committee? Constitution, Law and Justice Committee, yes. Constitution, Law and Justice Committee. And you're one of the, you're like, the. there's, there's Levine, who's the uh, a justice minister, and he's the one who rolled out these uh, proposed changes. You're the other guy right there. You're, you're, you're right there, and you're also probably going to come out with your own versions, I heard. Uh, the whole world... <laughs> is, is like freaking out, right? And I, I've been trying to calm people down, but let, I, and I know you're tired. You haven't slept in a long time. This is a, a short night that we have, a short few minutes that I have with you. Tell me in short, what are the, what are the basic guidelines of what the proposals for justice reform is in this country? Um, I think that people that know Israel but don't know the justice system in Israel don't really understand that the law system in Israel and the justice system in Israel is not like any other place in the world. In most democratic countries in the world, judges are being elected by the majority, like in the U.S., like in Canada, like in, in France, like in Germany, like in Switzerland, and then again, go on, Australia, everywhere in the world, in the democratic world, judges are being elected by the parliament or by the executive or a combination of both. Uh, in Israel, we have self-appointing judges. We have the same judges appointing the same judges, and the court is going far away from the public, and that's why the public trust in the court is plummeting for many years. That's a big problem. Uh, the court in Israel, we don't have a constitution, so there is no basis for judicial review of laws. Now, other countries who don't have a constitution, now the court just don't intervene in laws. That's the, that's the case in Britain or New mm. Zealand. In Israel, the court does intervene in laws, but based on what? Because we don't have a constitution. So it basically decides out of sync cloth. Reasonability. Yeah, it's not reasonable to legislate that like that. Now, you cannot rule a country, a democratic country, when you have an unelected judiciary who decides the laws for you. And, and so people, when I describe and I go around the world and I describe the system in Israel to people that know how systems work, they say, so why don't you change it? So now that's the time we change it. And we change it after we introduce a very detailed plan to the public before the elections. We got voted based on this plan. That's how democracy works and should work. So not to be worried. We're going to have a wonderful justice system. We're going to have a just justice system. Let's, let's like give about the, to have. Let's do the outlines. Just, just broad outlines. Not, not inside baseball, just broad outlines. What are the major changes? So first, we want to change the way we elect our judges. We want to introduce a system that gives the majority in the public a way to influence the court. Again, 
like any other democratic country in the world. In Israel, it does not exist. Um, so that's, that's a, a major change. A major, another major change is we want to make sure that the court knows its limits about uh, dealing with laws. If basic laws is the most, it's like the Israeli constitution. Meaning to say to give a framework for what the court can rule on. Yeah, because the, the court for many, many years, we didn't change the basic law of the court for many, many years. And they basically created a whole new jurisprudence out again, out of think laws. And, and you, you, do, you just cannot, you go to the court and it, you don't get a decision by the law or it depends which judge you go to and you get a decision if it's a religious judge or secular judge Arab an judge. Arab judge right. or a Jew judge you, you get different outcomes because it's not based on any law that's not a democratic way that's not a rule of law it's not even the rule of lawyers that's the rule of judges and that's not the democratic way to run and uh, of course we also have a problem a whole different story with the chief legal advisor, who basically also doesn't... Yeah, explain that to me just a tad. Just explain to me what happened. What, and that was today. It was in the news today. What, what, what was the change that you were proposing? In, 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 again, this is the Yoamashim law? Yeah. Right. In, in Israel, we have a chief legal advisor. Uh, if you go about the name, is an advisor. An advice, you can say yes or you can say no. You don't have to accept the advice. It's a legal opinion and advice, not, not, a, not a law. No, yeah, not a law. But, and that's, again, that's the way... All around the world, in Israel, the, somehow during the years, the court decided that the prime minister needs to obey the legal advisor, not the other way around. And if the prime minister does not agree, he cannot represent his view in the court because the legal advisor would go to the court and say, I know that the prime minister thinks X, but I think Y and I represent it. And you make a decision based on what I say and not about what the prime minister say. Again, does not exist anywhere in the world. It's very, very strange. And we need to change that because it created a lot of problems specifically on democratic issues. When you have the majority of the public in Israel wants to go one direction and the legal advisor, because of his politics, not because, because of, of the law, per- right. it goes the other way around and tells the, the prime minister, you cannot do that. All right, that's it? Those are the three? Yeah. That was great. That, those sound very, very reasonable. Simple. Very reasonable. Uh, one, last, one last point, and I do want to let you go. Uh, a, a lady today, I was being interviewed by a, a, a good but Zionist, but a left-leaning person. She said there's not going to be a good review, peer review process. She said that the, the other voices of the com- competing theories of law are not going to have time and committee to really speak out their opinions. And she, she gave a whole thing that, that they're not going to be heard and it's going to be rammed through. Uh, I, didn't, I don't really understand because we sat, I think, for... Uh, 16 or 20 hours about this reform and we are going to sit way more and the mo- most of the views that we heard in the committee were from the other side because I don't think that you get a lot of uh, 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 wisdom if you just listen to people that think the way you think. Right. I want to hear everyone I gave the opportunity in the committee to everyone and I will continue to do that and I invited everyone including former Chief Justice current Chief Justice uh, um, chief legal advisor, former chief legal advisor, former justice ministers, former ministers, professors from all. I, I invited many, many people. They all spoke. They will continue to speak. We will listen to them and we will decide at the end in a democratic way. Uh, we will try to convince each other and what we won't be able to convince, we will vote on. But that's the way democracy works all around the world. Israel should be not the only democratic country in the world. Israel is a democratic country. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. But we have a lot to learn from other democracies mm-hmm. around the world. Our system needs to be more like the American system, the Canadian system, the French, the British, Australian, whatever. Pick your any country and you will see that the Israeli system is an anomaly and that's what we are trying to change. All right, Knesset member Simcha Rothman from the Constitution Law and Justice Committee. You're the head of it. You're the chair. Congratulations, and we all wish you luck in uh, reforming Israel's justice system. Thank you very much. Ishai needs coffee. Please help support the show by buying Ishai coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Ishai. Thank you, and L'chaim. All right, folks, you are listening to the Ishai Fleischer Show, and it's really fun to be with you here. I'm literally sitting in the airplane Row 21, and uh, going to be taking off in just a few minutes. Thankfully, there's still some latecomers. That means I have some time to record for you. Uh, but 
Uh, I want to thank the folks that got a chance to speak with me this week, Uri Bank, Zev Ornstein, and, of course, Knesset member Simcha Rothman. Very good stuff. Uh, and, you know, we are at the, um, at the openings of the book of Exodus. Not the very opening, because that was last week. This week, the, the Torah portion of Vaera. And the magic word in this Torah portion is the word komemiut, uprightly. I'm going to take you uprightly out of the land of Egypt and into the land of Israel. You're going to walk straight up. You're going to walk standing up. You're no longer going to be enslaved. You're no longer going to be broken. You're going to be. You're going to rise and you're going to walk with, uh, uh, you know, with 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 dignity. And I'll tell you the truth. I I've always loved that word komemiut. I never knew why. In fact, even you know, uh, my like you know my my email addresses have komemiut, and it's just an important word to me. Komemiut. And it's, it's a word that appears only one time in the whole Torah. Kumemiyut. And then many years later, after loving this word, I kind of figured out that it has a deeper meaning. If you spell it out and play around with it a little bit, it really says, Kumi mimavet, arise from the death. Uh, arise and be reborn. Uh, arise and uh, be reinvented and re-embodied. Kumi mimavet. Uh, from your slumber arise from your from your from your death and that's what we believe that God remakes gives life to to uh, what's it called the resurrection of the dead and there's the grand concept of resurrection of the dead but I believe in resurrection of the dead every day every time a cell gets changed out uh, every time you put on a new pair of shoes every time uh, you have a new opportunity to make amends for a mistake that you made yesterday uh, that's Tchiatamitim. That's the resurrection of the dead. That's Kumi Mimavet, Kumi Miut. Let us walk uprightly to our good land, and let us also walk uprightly in our life, on a both personal, I thou relationship with God, and also the relationship that we have with the time that we're living in, in Jewish history, and we're all part of it, Jew and non Jew. Uh, if you love the story of God and you're a part of His, uh, a part of His, part of His resurrection uh, of history as is happening right now. I want to thank all of our sponsors. I don't have a lot of time to, tell, to thank everybody deeply. But of course, uh, we have our good friends at Retro Watch Guy, uh, RetroWatchGuy.com. Check out their great retro watches uh, and buy one and <laughs> have fun with it. Uh, a coupon code Yishai. Our good friends at uh, uh, ProhibitionPickle.co.il. Great food, great energy, uh, great Shabbos. ProhibitionPickle.co.il. Coupon code Yishai. Uh, our friends, of course, and, and, and my, my colleagues at the Hebron Fund, hebronfund.org, connects you to the two of the patriarchs and matriarchs in Hebron. Don't be afraid. Be there. Be part of it. Come on tour with Simcha Achbaum. Uh, be part of building it. Uh, and, of course, our friends also at the Land of Israel Network, uh, who make the show possible, Ari and Jeremy. Oh, they're closing the doors. i got to hurry this, this up. Uh, JewishPress.com, our good friends there. Uh, and who did I miss? Of course, the Israel Bible. Uh, a great Bible for you, israelbible.com. And uh, coupon code Yishai once again. So you have a lot of opportunities to be part of something great. And I want to thank you. Of course, write me an email. Thank you, Krista, for sending great support through buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. And that's it. I'm off. And I want to hear from you. Write me an email. Give me, give me, send me some love. Lots of blessings from the land of blessings from the airplane. Heading to the diaspora to find more sparks for the land of Israel. Lots of love, lots of connectivity, and shalom.